of every Christian. The regular readings that would normally be assigned have been set aside for this series that we might focus in on our book of discussion and study. And so today we continue in the book of Genesis, looking at Father Abraham and his faith. From Genesis chapter 12, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all possessions that he had accumulated, and the people that he had acquired in Haran. And then they set out for the land of Canaan. And then they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah in Shechem. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. We respond. From Psalm 100, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. The readings continue from chapter 15. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You will... You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for four hundred years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorite has not reached its full measure. And from the Catechism, when we pray, Our Father in heaven, what does it mean? finally from Genesis chapter 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here am I, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. 
We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took hold of the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham! Here am I, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, The Lord Will Provide. And to this day it is said, On the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. This is God's Word. Heavenly Father, as you called out to Abraham, so hear us say, here we are. And so speak to us, and let no ear be stopped, let no heart be unbelieving, but send your Holy Spirit in such a way that in a new way, and with a freshness, we receive your message, and with great joy, live it out. To the glory and honor of your name, and to Christ Jesus our Lord, amen. Every Christian lives by faith. There's just no other way to live with God other than by a wholehearted and utter and complete faith in which you trust Him and what He says. And you listen and then what He says is right and wrong becomes yours and you know that He, he has your best interest in at heart and in mind at all times, even in the depths of your pain and in your loss. It is by faith that we learn and that we live, but such faith is only seen when it is tested. And last week we saw the very first man and the first woman fail the test. They did not believe that God was good and was sustaining them in this beautiful garden and that they would only remain there and this world would only remain good as long as they did not eat the fruit from the center of the garden. But they did not believe God and they ate the fruit. The fruit that they did believe would give them everything that God has. Knowledge, power, the power of self-determination, and the wisdom of knowledge of good and evil. It was all there for the taking. And so they trusted themselves to be God. And that is what unbelief really is. It's, it's not simply an absence of total belief, but that the ultimate belief has been moved and removed from God now on to something or someone else, and that this thing or this one will now supply all of my needs of security and happiness and goodness in life. And so faith, every Christian needs to have a thorough understanding of what it is and what it is not, so that when the tests come, and they will come, because God uses these tests to Reveal and to refine your faith so that when the tests come, you will have all of the resources necessary of the Spirit of God to face them. And so, to understand faith, we turn to Abraham, the father of faith. 
He is the focus of all the readings you've just heard from Genesis. And for reasons that God alone knows, He came to Abraham and said, Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. And Abraham believed God. No questions asked, no IDs checked. He simply believed. And from this encounter then with Abraham and God, we learn then that faith has four parts. And that first, this faith that we see, it it is a trust in something yet unseen and to be revealed. For Abraham and Sarah, it would be a son. And then descendants as numerous as the stars in the night sky, a homeland that God Himself would fight for and protect. Finally, a nation of people through whom God would bless the entire earth. None of this, of course, Abraham could see or experience, and yet he simply trusted God to bring it all about. That's not to say that there wouldn't be any doubts or unbelief along the way, that there wouldn't be any major missteps, but through it all, God remained faithful to Abraham and would sustain him in this faith. And so that is then the second part of faith, and that it, it is a trust in one who will ultimately bring about everything that has been promised. God will do what He said. See, faith is not an optimistic and vague thinking that, well, somehow it's all going to work out in the end. I'm not sure how. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. No, we learn that faith isn't in God, but it is of God. And it's a, it's a very fine distinction. We don't just have a, a general idea that there is a God out there, but we trust God Himself to bring absolutely everything to light what He has then promised. And then the third part that we learn about faith from this encounter is that faith is active. It is an action. It's an attitude. It is a conviction. And for Abraham... When he was told to go, he simply went. One could hardly have considered Abraham to have believed God if he had not gone. And then finally, we learn that faith, while it is extremely personal, it is never private. But he shared his faith with his nephew Lot, with his wife Sarah, and with those of his company and servants and And we learn that then that's how faith works. The Holy Spirit takes from the speaker to the hearer, and when the Spirit so desires, faith is born. The message begets what is spoken by the Spirit. And so these four make up the parts of faith in that it is uh, unseen realities yet to come. It is in the ultimate one who will bring about these truths and realities. It is active and finally never private, but always shared. And it's not just this is Abraham's faith. This is what faith is. And every human being that God has made has this four-part faith. You have this too. So the question isn't do you have faith? Do you believe? But the question is Who do you trust? Who has your ultimate allegiance and reliance? And you can never really know that until the challenges and the tests come. And then it is all revealed. It's interesting in the the readings of Genesis how there was a very curious line. I don't know if you caught it in the first reading. As God shared about, you know, you're going to have this land. It's going to be awesome. And oh, by the way, the Canaanites live there. Oh yeah, it's inhabited by a bunch of people. And oh, by the way, they're going to be a big problem for you. Why would God leave the Canaanites there when their practices were detestable? And the Ammonites also in the second test. Well, why would he leave someone who have cultures with different gods, different beliefs? 
when these people would provide an ongoing and constant challenge to Abraham and his descendants. And the record is in the rest of the Old Testament of their failure to believe and then how they have become exactly like the cultures around them, using power and religion to get what they want rather than trusting in God. In fact, it really begs the question why God doesn't just clean it all up right now, even for us. You know, why is there an internet that has porn and, and hate groups and, you know, all kinds of religious ideas that contradict the Bible? Why does He allow our culture to pursue agendas in our schools and in our government and in higher institutions that are, are completely against God and deny His existence like evolution that we talked about last week? Well, God allows all of these external challenges because in them it will be revealed what's in your heart. Do you trust the world and its wisdom or God? Do you follow the world's right and wrong or do you follow what has been revealed by God in His absolute right and wrong? What's in your heart? It will be seen if you follow the culture or follow the one who made the culture. And these external uh, challenges, God will not uh, get rid of, and they will be with us until the end of time. And they're not just out there, but the challenges are also on the inside. There are internal challenges that take the form of waiting. Will you wait on me? Will you wait for me until I act? So we look at Abraham and Sarah who were given this great promise of a child and year after year until Sarah was as good as dead along with Abraham, it said it in the Bible, they had to wait. Will they wait on God or will they trust themselves to make it all happen? And so Abraham, he can't wait any longer. He's kind of got his plan B. You know, if God doesn't do his thing, I... I've got this friend over here, uh, Eliezer of Damascus. And then Sarah comes up with her brilliant idea. You know, well, what if you just take like my servant and have children with her? How did any of this work out? Well, read the rest of Genesis and you'll see very poorly and badly. How does it work out when you don't wait on the Lord and put your trust in His Word? See, it's the challenges on the outside and on the inside and it reveals this faith and where our heart truly has its allegiance. But there's one more test coming and it's, it's almost shocking to believe that it could happen and yet it's right there in the text. Sometimes, and for some people, God comes directly to them and He gives them a personal challenge. Will you trust me? It will be seen in what you do next. Will I be your ultimate, your ultimate resource to provide you with love and care and security? It will be seen right now by what you put first. And so Abraham is asked to take his son that finally comes through Sarah, Isaac, the promised child. Take this son, the one you love, to the mountain I will show you and sacrifice him there. Why would God do this? Well, it says right there in the text why he did it. It revealed his heart. And he's got the knife in his hand. You know, they're shouting at him, don't do it from heaven. You know, it's, just, it's a test. And yet, that's the kind of relationship that God has with us. That he wants us to see where our alliances really are. In fact, when you look at most of the stories in the Bible, they're really centering around this question, do you believe in me? Will you wait for me? Am I your ultimate source and resource for your security, your happiness, and to satisfy all of your desires? Who do you trust? And more times than not, it seems, in the Scriptures, the answer was, not you, God. And I must be very clear at this point that the whole point of the tests and the challenges are not so that you can see a, a pass or a fail. You know, God did not tell Abraham to go sacrifice his son to see if he'd pass the test. 
He does, he does not give anyone that challenge to see if you'll pass or test. Because if you don't, if you fail, oh, I'm, I'm done with you. And if you pass it, gold star for you. That is not the function of the challenges or the tests. Well, if not that, then what are the functions? Well, there are two of them, and you've heard me already mention them. They are to reveal and to refine your faith. So that even as you fail the tests of faith, and you see that you really, in your heart of hearts, you do not have God as the ultimate one to whom you've clasped, and if all else is lost, you're okay because you have Him. Even as you realize, that's not me. I don't have that kind of faith. The purpose is so that you might see the truth and the reality of that, and then by the Spirit cry out, and Lord, help me in my unbelief. Remember the father who cried out to Jesus as he's, he's wanting his son to be healed and, and Jesus said, well, anything's possible for those who believe and the father realizes his heart isn't quite in that and I believe, but help me in my unbelief. And since we're in the New Testament, look at Peter who failed horribly. I don't know the man and the rooster crows and Jesus is taken off to be crucified. He failed. But three days later, the resurrected Jesus, one of the first few things that he says to the women who are about him, he says, go tell the disciples and tell Peter. He singled out Peter. Why? Because Peter's got to know. Peter's got to know that that cross, that death was, was also for him. And Peter has to know that I am resurrected from the dead and that I'm thinking about him, I'm talking about him. He has to know this because that's what's going to give him faith that it's going to be okay, Peter. I have you. While you have been faithless, God has remained faithful. And Thomas, Thomas, they're like all rallying around Thomas. We saw him. He's alive. He's alive. And Thomas like, nope, nope, unless I can put my fingers right there where the nails went in. Not going to believe it. And Jesus shows up. He says, Thomas, put your hand in my side. Put your fingers here. These two failures were given faith. But the third failure failed. Judas, he failed just as miserably as the other two, but his end was different. Why? While the others failed Judas then killed himself. Why was that? What was different about Judas than the other two? And it has to do with about faith and the way that faith works with its four parts. See, faith is the ultimate trust in someone. And where was Judas' faith then? It was in himself. And he had done something that he knew was completely horrible. And trusting in himself, he knew that there was only one then who could make it right. And that was himself. And faith is always an action. And so he put that faith into action and he took his own life, hoping that in some way and in some small way, maybe this will make up for a little bit of what I've done. See, that's how faith works. It is an ultimate trust. It is an action. It's in something yet unseen. And yet, as we fail, we have before us the same path. Will the Spirit take us down to the path of faith or will we refuse it and remain our own gods like, Abraham, like Adam and Eve as they took the fruit? Will we take matters and actions into our own hands and kill ourselves in some way before God? Well, don't think too long on this for faith comes by hearing from speaker to hearer. Hear Jesus speak from the cross and his empty tomb to you. He calls out Peter's name and Thomas's name. He calls out your name. He gives you what needs to be believed. I have died for you. I am risen for you. And then that is your ultimate. And then that is your action. And then that is what is shared. Because the challenges that will continue to come in your life, they will continue to refine this faith. 
continually to reveal this faith, and, and they refine it in such a way that you become more and more like Jesus in your goodness and kindness and faithfulness in which other people see it, and then faith, the Spirit uses that to strengthen their faith. See, every Christian, we live by this kind of faith as a gift from God. Amen. Let us then stand and put that faith into action as we confess our faith of the words of the Nicene Creed.